AI began with an ancient wish to forge the gods. A long time ago, the Greeks had some thoughts about golden robots, which weren't actually called robots because the term had not been invented yet, and milk-white statues coming to life. Their ancient wish remaining a wish, needless to say that so far the Greeks did not invent the first artificial intelligence. The Middle Ages came about and rumors spread of secret mystical or alchemical means of placing minds into matter. A couple of new myths were created, such as the Taquin and the Homunculus and the Golem. But again, stories remained just that, stories. Soon it was the 19th century and even more stories implanted the idea of artificial beings and thinking machines. This time in books like Frankenstein and R.U.R. Rossum's Universal Robots, which was finally a case where the term robot was actually used. Across all this timeline described before, realistic automatons were being built by crafty people and in turn misinterpreted to have very real minds and emotions by way of an effort that we now have come to call fake news. You are fake news. What we have achieved so far was an assumption that the process of human thought could be mechanized as part of a long history of study into mechanical or formal reasoning. In the 17th century, a dynamic trio, Leibniz, Hobbes and Descartes, explored the possibility that all rational thought could be made as systematic as algebra or geometry. In the 20th century, there was a key insight in the form of the Turing machine, a simple theoretical construct that captured the essence of abstract symbol manipulation. This sparked the earliest real research into thinking machines in the late 30s, 40s and early 50s. Recent research in neurology had shown that the brain was an electrical network that fired in all or nothing pulses. Alan Turing's theory of computation showed that any form of computation could be described digitally. Big whoop. By now, everybody was solidly convinced of the possibility of an artificial brain sometime in the near future. Or, as for the decades leading up to now, we would come to wishfully timeline it right around the corner. People made little analog toys called turtles and beasts, using analog circuitry and in general just having an overall grand old time. In 1951, a man called Minsky built a machine called Snark and moved on to become an innovator in AI for the next 50 years. One year before that, Alan Turing published a cool little paper in which he waxed philosophical about machines that think, calling such behavior difficult to define, and devised his famous test, which was promptly named after after him, you know, scientists need their 15 minutes too. In fact, his 15 minutes carried over into the decades after, as by his method we will now logically assume that a machine is thinking when it can carry a conversation indistinguishable from a human being. When computers learn to play chess, by which we really mean when computers were programmed to play chess, so-called game AI would forever be used as a measure of progress in the field. In 1955, a program now making use of this brand new invention called digital computing proved the first 38 theorems outlined in the Principia Mathematica and found a few more elegant proofs for some. This led some hopefuls to proclaim that the venerable mind-body problem had been solved and an explanation had been found for how a system composed of matter could have properties of mind. This idea would later become known as strong AI. Finally, in 1956, during the Dartmouth conference, everybody was properly convinced to adopt the term artificial intelligence as the true name of the field. Good job. Man. This was the year where AI gained its name, mission, first successes and major players and is widely considered as the birth of AI. We were now in the time of discovery. Gaining new ground and programs developed during this time were simply astounding to most people. Researchers were highly optimistic and most of them would swear that in less than 20 years we would have a fully intelligent machine. This era would last from 1956 to 1974. No fully intelligent machine was ever developed. Most early AI programs would be based on something called reasoning as search, in which a goal was tried to be completed by proceeding step by step towards it by making a move or deduction and back tracking whenever a dead end was reached. Yeah, problem. Turns out that a lot of problems have an astronomical amount of possible paths through such a maze, so we do what we do best in such a situation, give it a name. That name would become combinatorial explosion. They tried reducing the search space by using heuristics or rules of thumb to eliminate paths that were unlikely to lead to a solution, which in many cases turned out to be itself very unlikely to lead to a solution for strong AI. They tried some things, giving them names or what qualified 
various names at the time as they went along like General Problem Solver, Geometry Theorem Prover, Saint and Strips. By now a subfield of AI had some minor success and natural language processing could solve high school algebra word problems. Also Eliza, the world's first chatbot was developed and even occasionally fooled some people into believing her canned responses were coming from a real human. This type of foolery would continue even till this day whenever a media outlet happens to interview a certain intelligent robot. In the late 60s people wanted to woos out and proposed that AI research should focus on artificially simple situations known as micro worlds, simplifying the models to gain more success. A nice world of blocks was developed. And sure enough, this led to some huge improvements in computer vision, so there's that, I guess. Something with an unpronounceable name was the crowning achievement of this micro world program which is just bad marketing. Ironically, it could communicate in plain English. Time for some optimistic predictions, thought some scientists, because you know science is all about speculation. In 1958, H.A. Simon and Alan Newell say that within 10 years a digital computer will be the world's first chess champion. In 1965, H.A. Simon says machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. In 1967, Marvin Minsky says within one generation the problem of creating artificial intelligence will be substantially solved. In 1970, Marvin Minsky says in three to eight years we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. Tough luck guys. In 1967, Japan initiated the Weibot project, which was completed in 1972 in the form of the Weibot Dash 1 robot. It could do some cool stuff for the time. They made a second version, because if you're going to call your robot something that one you must make at least one other version then it was winter or at least we entered the first AI winter where the field was all of a sudden subject to a lot of critique financial setbacks and just overall naysaying kind of what happens when you set expectations so high with all these highly scientific predictions they were making and then fail to deliver on any of it of course new ideas were explored during the winter but people were just keeping their head down for now. You see there were some fundamental problems. Of course the elephant in the room has always been computer power. But there was more. Interactability and the combinatorial explosion for instance. Common sense knowledge and reasoning. More of X paradox. The frame and qualification problems. Ok so no more money and all the scientists go stand in a corner and think about what you have done over the last few years. Of course with the playing field now wide open, philosophers burst into the room and started waxing well um, philosophical about the problems they saw when it came to the claims made by AI researchers. A lot of blah blah blah. There was a dark age too, surrounding the perceptron. Frank Rosenblatt invented it. Marvin Minsky brought them to a sudden halt with his devastating critique on them. But it turns out all along, they were important, revived and a vital ingredient to the deep learning revolution. So all's well's ends well. Except that Rosenblatt would never live to see his invention make it in the end as he died in a boating accident shortly after Minsky ripped him a new one. Then gangs formed. On the one hand you had the neats and on the other hand you had the scruffies. From AI winter into AI boom. This is 1980 to 1987 where a new form of AI program took over. This new kid on the block was called Expert Systems and adopted by corporations all over the world as knowledge became the focus of mainstream AI research. Knowledge. Also a connectionism saw a revival. AI was back in the spotlight and again praised for its successes. In 1981, Japan decides that money talks and sets aside 850 million to see if they can write some cool code that can carry a decent conversation, translate a language, interpret a picture and or generally reason like a human being. This was called the fifth generation computer project and was written in prologue. It was written in prologue. Prologue. Other countries quickly responded with their own projects and large scale funding in the AI world had returned. Well winter came again, who could have predicted that seasonal change? Robotics researchers demanded an entirely new approach to artificial intelligence. And as we all know, robots are cool and artificial intelligences drew. So back in the corner the scientists went. Oh by the way, the term AI winter was coined by researchers with too much time on their hands. Probably a side effect from not getting your shit together. In the late 80s a couple of researchers seeing a lack of hip stress movement in their field developed a concept they came to call Nouvelle AI. Which tried to convince those left behind in the still thinking of the 
the current that true intelligence can only develop if a machine has a body. To make this concept more palatable for people to swallow, they also refer to this as embodied reasoning. This was quickly mocked by people who were afraid of such radical thinking and starkly refuted in papers that described how elephants don't play chess. In the mid 90s AI finally started achieving some of its oldest goals, which were pretty old now as the field was about half a century of age by now. Its reputation was still less than pristine at the moment, so not many people paid much attention, or formulated in another way, many people paid very little attention. People of course desperately cling to Moore's law and use it more as an excuse than anything else. Nouvelle AI was now retro and the in crowd needed a new clique, so their focus shifted to intelligent agents. We are now trying to maximize our chances of success by perceiving our environment and taking actions. Remember the two gangs we talked about earlier? Well, spoiler alert, the Neats won. Many researchers were in hiding because of the bad rap AI had gotten over the years and everybody was in underground clubs called informatics, knowledge based systems, cognitive systems or computational intelligence. Nobody wanted to be seen as a wild eyed dreamer because even at the highest level of scientific excellence, personal reputation is a person's greatest good. Everybody was comfortably ignoring complex problems like common sense reasoning and reveling in the fact that simple problems had simple solutions and so the deep learning revolution. Given a little phenomenon called big data, and of course thank you Mr. Moore, faster computers, we were now able to develop advanced machine learning techniques. By 2016 the market for AI related product reached 8 billion dollars and as part of the reported frenzy would pretty much guarantee seed investment for any startup pitching it in between other buzzwords. Have we learned anything? Yes, we have learned a lot. We have learned that the fundamental techniques over more than half a century have not changed, but we have finally managed to make it work, and anecdotal evidence suggests that after every success, winter follows.